I have a friend who's a um, head coach for an NFL team. And I asked him once, like, who's the, who's the hardest team to talk to? He said, team that's winning. You know, they're on a winning streak. They think they know how to do it. They don't listen in the locker room. I said, well, who's the, who's the easiest person? Or who's the easiest team to talk to? I'll never forget. He looked me straight in the eye and he said something. He said, nobody listens like a desperate person. Hmm. I thought about it a lot since he said it. And I wonder if it's true because I th sometimes think like desperate people, they're like, yes, they're desperate, but they still won't listen. Do you have that experience in therapy? Yeah, I think, I think it's probably a little harder the more interior we're talking. And when we get into the desperation that comes yeah. from... Whoa, 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 whoa. There's something more interior than football? <laughs> this is America. This, we, we cannot... We I know, I know, like I know. I'm I mean, treading on dangerous this territory. Is a very here. dangerous conversation. Now. Yeah, we're going to have to just suspend judgment for a moment. All right. And, and just on. let us go forward. Carry on, carry on. I think, I think we're talking about the inner recesses of our spiritual life, our emotional life, our sense of self and identity, the way that relates to the universe and our, our, our destiny. I mean, these are really powerful realities. And we're opening these things up to the pain and suffering that most of us are constantly protecting against. I mean, this is really dangerous stuff. So it's not just surgery on the table with a scalpel, opening and closing the body. This is surgery of the heart, opening and closing the soul. So there's a lot of reason to be really guarded and defensive here. And a lot of people suffer with very deep desperation. And all it does is cause more defensiveness and guardedness. And in many ways, I say, rightly so. Yeah. Good for you. One thing I do a lot of work with is helping people have more compassion on themselves. Even the parts you don't like about yourself, even your guardedness, your defensiveness, even your anxiety disorder, even your depression, compassion. Because at the end of the day, thank God, you have a survival instinct that's created a defense mechanism that helped you get through the terrifying things you've lived through in your life. And it doesn't even have to be huge capital T trauma for a child. Being yelled at by dad can be the worst experience of a person's life. So if we have parts that emerge as a survival instinct, that's how God made us. Thank God. So we have to understand first how to have compassion. Compassion for ourselves, for all our parts. And then we establish some safe ground. Sometimes I lead the charge in saying, it's okay to talk about these things. And we can start to open these things up. So you touch on something that I've thought a lot about, you know, um, spent the last 30 years traveling around, you know, speaking to people in businesses and churches and, you know, all sorts of venues, but a lot in churches. And I'm, I'm astounded how prevalent uh, self-loathing, shame, lack of empathy for self is in an environment like church where the teaching is exactly the opposite of that. Um, what's your reflection on that? Yeah, my, I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Let's have it. And I hope it's not too bold or too far afield. There's no such thing. Uh, but I, I think that, and, and it's not even a reflection of our current church or the current anything. This has been hundreds of years of God trying to tell us over and over again how much he loves us. And we don't get it. We are so thick, especially in the church environment. And we can go all the way back. I mean, we could go all the way back to Jesus Christ himself. I mean, hello, what else do we need? But apparently we needed more. So we need 2,000 years of the saints and divine revelation we need Jesus appearing to St. Margaret Mary Alcoke talking about his sacred heart, the divine love captured within the, the finitude of his humanity 
offered to us to bring us to his divinity. We don't get it. We need Faustina to, to hear the revelation of divine mercy, his ocean of mercy that will swallow every bit of our imperfection. We don't get it. We need Therese. We need John Paul II. We need the theology of the body. Love, 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 love. We don't get it. And meanwhile, people are leaving the church. People are wounded by the church. The church, lowercase c, is wounded, is, is, is off on all sorts of different trajectories. We don't get it. And at the end of the day, all God is trying to say is, I love you. God is love, but we don't get it. And, you know, people say this all the time. They talk the talk. They have a devotion to divine mercy. They pray the, the chaplet. They have a devotion to this, that. And then it's like, all right, let's just talk about the last hour of your life. Tell me the things that went through your head. Just tell me, like, what kind of self-criticisms went through your head? What kind of shame are you carrying about yourself? Your body, your, your, how much money you make, your family life, your vocation. And you just go down the list and eventually, inevitably, you list five things, one of them is gonna hit. And then they're like, ah. Oh. And then I go like this. What do you feel about yourself for feeling that feeling? Oh yeah, it's terrible. Like, there we go again. You don't even have compassion on your lack of compassion. <laughs> At what point do we realize Jesus came to love us? He went to every corner and every pocket of sinner to love them. He sought the sinners and he didn't show up saying, hey, sinner, I'm here for you. He said, I love you. And then they were captured by his gaze, by his love, by his compassion. And then they want to know more about how to be better. They want to know how to enter into his love. Of course, that's the second step. But we're so bent in our church on, the, on that second step being the first step. Mm. You know, well, we, we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. So let's make sure we're making every sinner know where they're sinning because we hate that sin. Like, we don't get it. And meanwhile, we're preaching to smaller and smaller and smaller parishes. And there's less and less and less money. And the bishops are looking around going, what's happening here? Oh, it must be the culture. Has nothing to do with the culture. Has to do with not getting it, not listening, not hearing God tell us how much he loves us. That's what we need as the church to believe so that we can proclaim that loudly and proudly and bring people into that beauty and give them the healing that they're looking for.